from time to time I get guitar sounds when I'm mixing that kind of box me into a specific sound and that sound every once in a while is not as good as it could be. So I took the opportunity to talk to my friend Joe Barisi. Joe, welcome. Yeah, uh, I, actually, you should say welcome to me. I'm in your welcome facility. Welcome to my lair. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I said, Joe's going to help us out. Uh, the workshops that you do, you, you, you go into this in a little more depth than the ProSound workshops, right? We do, yeah. We go into, um, into a lot of detail in two-day workshops and um, uh, on drums, guitars, mixing, everything. But uh, it's a lot of fun, actually. How, uh, uh, w philosophically, what is a good guitar sound, uh, a rock guitar sound? Like, let's say, let's say we're not talking about the rock world, a good guitar sound, but say a, an R&B song or a, or a, a hip-hop song or even a pop song. It, I, I'm, I like that, that humbucker through a Marshall sound, but sometimes they take up too much space. How can you imply that power of a rock guitar inside a, a different medium? genre? Um, I think for me in general a good guitar sound has some low end. I think a lot of people shy away from the bottom so I'm like you I'm a fan of the humbucker through the Marshall and it, it does it does give you a full frequency you know as opposed to a strum and I, I think a strats and telly is I more think a clean guitar mm -hmm. and less polished and humbucker Marshall um, so for me it has to have a little more bottom but like you say it does take up a lot of space and I, I think um, how you can get more power out of something like that is by pushing a little more air. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to have all that super low end or when you're mixing, sometimes you think about pushing the bass above the guitar. Right. Most people think the other way around, the bass is really the bottom and the guitar sits higher, but... That's the way I thought. I mean, sometimes I treat it as the guitar is really reaching down That's low interesting. and the bass is really kind of in the mid-range in a way and you can always generate some sub bass you know right. when you're when you're mixing obviously your master of bottom um i always pull up your presets too and i'm using <laughs> renaissance bass and things like that <laughs> oh go my god the preset. yeah when you do be careful about the input I, I probably got a little loud on that one but i i use it all the time to synthesize notes that disappear too which yeah. is it's great for Same stuff thing. like that um it, in terms of the performance element of it, I've always kind of felt, um, and not just me, the world of guitar players, when you're, u the more distortion you're using, the fewer strings you need to play. Is that still an adage that you think would help us here? Yeah, I, I, I think um, a lot of times it's easy to play dirty, and most people think the dirty is, you know, a bigger, heavier sound, but actually it's the cleaner, the ACDC type. Yeah, I was just thinking you know, of that. Where you, where you, if you have the opportunity to play the part through a cleaner amp or less gain, um, being able to play harder and getting more of the power amp distortion and speaker distortion as opposed to, um, you know, fizz through a distortion pedal, that doesn't necessarily make things bigger. It's really the the clean power that that most people Realize it's like most people don't realize that the cleaner the amp actually it could sound heavier um, Some of the some of the more recent records you've done that that catch my ear the new Slipknot Queens of the Stone Age some of those records is the is the 60s concept that we all kind of adopted from uh, From England where if you if you want a big sound go to a smaller amp is that still part of the process you mentioned about about taking uh, an, an amp almost identical to this, throwing it in a, throwing yeah. it in a, a cooler and being part of a Queens of the Stone Age sound. Yeah, I mean, on on Lullaby's record, we actually had a little Marshall micro stack and put it inside of like an igloo cooler. And at that time, <laughs> we were like super into using unconventional unconventional uh, means of recording. Yeah. So, you know, you'd cut the XLR off and fish the cable through the spigot and re-solder it back on and then we were using these blue mics called the ball oh, that yeah. looked just kind of crazy but love blue but we, we were striving for a different kind of sound so um you, you're surprising you know i mean realistically when you when you see bands play live and they're playing they see you know 16 half stacks uh -huh. really they might only have a single 12 mic underneath or the stage. they might be cardboard or exactly so the idea of using something small like this and 
with a microphone in front of this, you know, I mean, it's... This these, is are, a, these are affordable, too. You said that you use cheap. these. These are actual little amps built into cigarette cases around 50 bucks, and you said that these make their way onto a lot of records, too. These are, are um, actually... The, the whole idea behind this was always trying to get feedback in the control room. So I was looking for a way to split the guitar signal into something that was manageable where you didn't have another amp blasting you in the face the whole time. So I thought, why, why not get a little amp? We were talking earlier about yeah. the little Radio Shack white amplifiers. Oh, and yeah. this sort of the same concept. I'll take a, a feed off of this you and were, hold it in front of your guitar pickup and get all kinds of crazy feedback. Let me do some hand puppets here. You were, you were playing it like this so you could hold this close to the pickup and get some feedback. Exactly. That was, that was amazing. Did and you this smoke? will actually power a 412. I mean, no it's, it's serious. I mean, it's there's enough juice in there when the battery's working. And you actually smoked the cigarettes that came in these, didn't you? Um, well, you know, I'm a, more of a camel guy. Oh, look, there's so a battery in there. there. It is. That's where it goes. Damn, but, man. But, you know, things like this is something that you could do at home. You don't necessarily have to own a uh, What is this Marshall company? Hunt. They're called Smokey. I don't <laughs> even know if they're still in business, but I'm sure they're all over the Internet. <laughs> and uh, there's so many of these little kinds of amps. I mean, Marshall still makes mm -hmm. micro stacks and the high, you know, high watts and fenders. And, and that, that actually, the, the one modeled after the Watkins Dominator actually has a fairly good tremolo in it. Wow. Really good. And a little echo, too. So in terms of, um, let's, don't, let's don't call them mistakes, but in terms of um, getting closer to what their intended purpose for a guitar is, what are, what are some solutions for getting too much that buzzy top end? Is, is it just understanding you don't need it? Um, you know, I think a lot of, well, for, I mean, for me, a lot of problems in the recording process stem from the fact that you don't know what you're really hearing. So it all really comes back oh, down to deep. your, you know, it comes back to your listening environment. You might not ever hear all that buzzy top end because your, your speakers are, you know, so bright in general that that's what you're used to hearing or, or your speakers are so dark that you're adding so much of that. So, so it really comes down to the source, how you're translating it. But I think excitement generally translates with high end. I mean, who doesn't want to hear something that's a little bit brighter and snappier and that yeah. makes it excited. So your tendency is to, especially on guitars, but realistically, I mean, what does a guitar speaker put out at the top of its range? 4K. Yeah, I mean, if, if that, so. Uh, I mean, cranking 12K on a guitar is pretty well useless. Yeah. I mean, maybe you're getting some kind of harmonics somewhere. And what's your thought on, speaking of harmonics, what's your thoughts on, on odd and even harmonics? Are, are you, can, can they get a good sound with a transistor emulation? I guess these are transistors. Yeah, those are good all sound. transistors. They're probably FETs, which has a more of a even har more of an odd harmonic. I think the key there is the fact that it's actually coming out of a speaker. So it's whether the speaker is a good speaker or a crappy speaker, it's still coming out of a speaker, and there's some kind of air motion, and um, there's a microphone. So now you're adding another flavor, and then out of that microphone has to go to a preamp. Whether it's a Mackie preamp or a Neve preamp doesn't matter. It's a flavor of a preamp. So I think part of that routing, as opposed to slapping a plug in on something and just turning a knob and there's your distortion. There's really no kind of air moving at all. Just something as simple as that, or you know, just adding a little bit of that flavor in makes a bigger sound, a more usable sound, especially when you're mixing too. You don't necessarily need a, a clean DI guitar to reamp when you're mixing. You just, I mean, we never even called it reamping back then. We used to just <laughs> no. take the signal and turn the fader down or go into a compressor. Yeah, just run it out there is what we call and, it. And you'd want to change the sound anyway, so you'd do right. whatever it took. And that's, you know, I always say that's why there's EQ with plus 15 and minus 15 on it, because you, sh you yeah. can and will <laughs> use that. If you look at yeah. my console, you'll see some of that on there. Yeah. Um, I, I just recently, by the way, found out that faders can move down. I thought they only moved in one wow. direction. Oh, yeah, they only go down after you bump them up for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your take on, and we'll, we'll end, end with this, what's your take on, on the state of virtual guitar amps, software guitar amps? Uh, UAD's making some good ones. There's a lot of good ones out there. Have you found that to be a viable alternative for, for a person working at home? And yeah. Do you uh, have any, any suggestions on on a, a, an affordable one? Um, I, I will say that I try them all because I'm always curious as to what's gonna, you know, maybe replace 
reamping through a Marshall or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And, and for me, it's still a combination of going into a head and using maybe a speaker emulator. So it's, I could be super lazy and not have to go mic it or mm -hmm. in the middle of the night, not worry about waking anybody up. But there are, Scuffman makes some good stuff. My friend James Santiago works for UA and he's, he's been here on many occasions. Mm -hmm. What I love about him is we've done a lot of tests. We'll listen to multiple amps and try to emulate it. We'll take direct out of the back of heads and EQ them to try to make them is sound there like the a real UA deal. that you find? I actually don't have any UA plugins, so I can't tell you. But <laughs> I do have. I mean, I've tried the Scuffman stuff. It's cool. The Positive Grid guys have some interesting yeah. stuff. You know, a classic one for me is Waves GTR. Man, I still I use the hell out of that on everything, whether it's a guitar or a vocal or drums. Yeah. I think that their emulations of an old Tube Screamer and an Overdrive and the delays and the reverbs. I I just mixed something where a guy was combining the Waves GTR. I had a vibrato and a spring reverb together. Wow. And it would create a little warble into the spring reverb, and it's such a great, unique sound. So, wow. the the waves, you know, the classic Sansan plugin, I still use that because yeah, it's so me flexible. Too. I mean, just the four knobs are so flexible from a clean sound to a super yeah. dirty sound. It's just, um, yeah. So I, I, you know, amp wise, I've, I think I've pretty much tried them all. I still, in a bind, I'll go for a Sans amp because it's easy. But yeah. Waves GTR is. Fantastic too, cool. I think. So Joe, thanks for sharing this with us. Uh, learned a lot today. <laughs> um, you think you think you do this for a minute and you play guitar, but there's always something new to learn, right? Isn't there? I learn every day, man. I you know just talking to you for a few minutes and just uh, you know, it just re-inspires you to yeah. reevaluate what you do. Also, I mean, it yeah. really is. It, I think that's what keeps you growing. It's a good. It's a good good thing to be. I always enjoy hanging out with you. Thank you um, for coming, Dave. Man, my pleasure. It's always inspirational. I, I, I'm going to dig out my old Radio Shack white speaker now, too. I know, <laughs> I know where it is. It's in the trunk of guitar pedals over there. <laughs> uh, so, in a couple of weeks, March, I mean, excuse me, May 14th, 14. you're doing your first live stream. That's got to be a little a little nerve-wracking and a, and a lot of... Uh, it is. Um, my partner Chad Bamford and I we um, we've hosted a bunch of workshops and we we've tried to develop a community of uh, you know it really comes down to getting stuff to mix and hearing it and just saying wow this could be so much yeah. better and, and how do we impart that knowledge which is disappearing you know fast and, and so that's uh, going to be May 14th yeah, which is uh, a Saturday Saturday May 14th and it's going to be on a specific topic when we when we do the workshops it's usually a, Two days. This is going to be a three-hour on-demand. What's the topic? As well, splitting guitars. So, multiple oh. guitar cabinets, cabinets and heads and combos together. Multiple microphones. Getting kind of the why and the how and what to look for. And wouldn't you say the, the into <coughs> excuse me the into the lair that that you guys just watched? That's a, that's a good topic to have under your belt. That, that skill set so you can actually improve some of your guitar sound. So we're also uh, going to touch on direct with a uh, real speaker and getting the phase right between those two because that's a super important thing too. I think it's super easy to, to record direct guitars with a speaker emulator um, but to be able to use an actual speaker and get the two in phase with each other you can get some really great guitar tones. Well, man I can't wait. So um, prosoundworkshop.com uh, I promise you Joe is there's none better. Um, you're gonna learn a lot, and uh, you, I'm pretty sure that if if you can't make a record as good as Joe, he'll refund part of the money, right, Joe? I'll give it all back. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. You, you, it's, it's interactive too, which is great. So if you have oh. specific questions, we're gonna be able to you'll be able to pick Chad and I's brain, and um, and you know, we also go beyond th we really do want you to learn and get the answers that you're looking for so it's not just a one time I tell you amigo I, I listen to your records and I learn just from uh, from listening to the records so I can't imagine having you actually imparting some of the information that you've gathered over the years um, how that can't be anything but just incredibly instructive next time <laughs>